Let's talk about career progression as an international programmer. How's it going? My name's John. I'm a programmer with about a decade of experience. I'm from the US. I've worked for companies you've heard of like Amazon and Capital One. I also have a PhD in economics where I studied the economics of the tech labor market. I have over 20,000 followers. Less than half of my followers are from the United States. I've had two international programmer consultations this week alone. So I thought that I would jot down my thoughts. I've come to learn a few things simply due to my preparatory research when I meet with these, uh, these individuals where I do consults. So the main advice I'll provide falls into two categories. The first category in the light blue in the upper left is things that I would say to anyone, even if they're from the United States, that is my standard advice. We can see the standard advice is concisely summarized in three numbered items. In yellow, we have a GitHub repository. Here's the GitHub repository, it's open source. And you can go to the curriculum file and you will get much more detail about my standard advice. It's open source, contributions are welcome. The numbers one through seven outside of the blue and yellow are peculiar to international workers. And we will see five, six, seven, it actually depends which country you're coming from. One through four are going to be fairly general for any country, particularly if you have an interest in coming to a Western country, and particularly if you have an interest in coming to the United States. Bear in mind, one through seven are not exactly in order of priority. One through four are in the order that I recommend them. Five, six, seven are not in an order of recommendation. It's hard to prioritize them because that's a conditional, right? Um, so that is why I have the green circles to highlight the fact that one and five are actually my biggest recommendations. Four is in red because I do not recommend this for most professional programmers. If you're particularly interested in pursuing a programming role as a job, going back into the education system, going back into a system where you're spending money rather than earning money, from the economic perspective is not gonna be ideal for most people. Before we continue, make sure to hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm so this video will be spread to everyone and we can make sure everyone in the whole world gets improved access to learning to code. I also encourage you to subscribe and hit the no notification bell. So let's start from the top of this decision tree. Social networking is something that everyone should be doing. I had a consultation recently with an international programmer and this individual asked me if I had any advice about how to immigrate to the United States. The first thing I asked them is whether they have any family in the United States. This person told me that they had two cousins that had recently immigrated to California. I said, why are you talking to me? Pick up the phone. <laughs> um, that is to say that the advice that I'll give is very general, but if you have a family member or a close contact who has successfully immigrated from your country to, to the country that you're interested in immigrating to, they are likely going to have more specific and practical advice for you. Second is Juan Solting. Juan Solting has a course on immigration. I'll show you the course. I'll also show you quickly this TikTok that I made, basically copying their tips, and you can see these specific tips. One will be searching for H1B jobs. And particular emphasis, again, to the discussion on my visa jobs and E-Verify. Feel free to scroll back and pause if you want to review those again. So those are some tips from Juan Salting. So Jonathan here is the CEO, and those tips were from him. Here we are on onesalting.com slash courses, and you can search for this string, International Job Seeker Course. It's not free. It's part of the Juan Salting Career Course Premium Option. There's a payment plan. There's also a one-time payment option. So I think these are another group of experts in the area that I would refer you to. This is not highlighted in green. It's not for everybody. It's not free. Another option that's not free is an immigration lawyer. Whatever your target country is, whether it's the United States, Canada, Australia, any of the other countries that you'd like to immigrate to, contacting a high competence immigration lawyer in that country is an effective option. It's often not cheap, but it is effective. By the way, if you have successfully immigrated or if you are an immigration lawyer and you have some additional tips, please do comment. I would very much appreciate it and I know the audience would as well. The next option is the student visa. This is gonna be expensive, not the out-of-pocket expense necessarily, which may be addressable through scholarship, but the opportunity cost of having to delay your career to go back, whether you're in a master's program or a PhD, I would certainly recommend pursuing the master's program because that is only one or two years long if you're going to take this option. I'm assuming there that you already have a bachelor's, Certainly, if you don't have a bachelor's degree, that actually might be a good option. Finally, let's talk about option five, which is my personal favorite, 
If you are coming from a country with a big tech presence, for example, India, you can get a job with a big tech company like Google or Amazon or Meta or many of the others. You can directly apply for jobs in the United States, provided your interviewing skills are sufficient, your resume is sufficient. It is difficult, it is highly competitive, but it is also a really great option for some people. You can also get a job in your home country and work for six to 24 months. Keep in touch with your manager. Let them know that you're interested in eventually moving to the United States. Conduct social networking inside of the company with other people who may be from your home country. And somewhere between six and 24 months, if you have been performing at a high standard, you will usually be able to transfer. So that is by far my favorite strategy. Obviously it's difficult to get a big tech job, but that is my favorite strategy. We need to consider some countries where big tech does not have a presence. I recently got a consultation with an individual from Somalia. There are not Google offices. There are not meta offices in Somalia. In the entire country in LinkedIn jobs, there appear to be 22 results. Virtually all of them are senior. The individual that I spoke to had a background in Python. As far as I could tell, there was only one job in the entire country for which he might even possibly qualify, presuming the interview went well, which is never guaranteed, is it? The main solution is to leave the country. You can also consider freelancing. Unfortunately, if we're talking about coming to the United States, that's often difficult, not because of the cost. Summing up to the range of four to 9,000 between the government filing fees and the lawyer costs, for a high competence programmer, four to $9,000 is not a problem for a large American company. They may tell you the problem is the cost, but in fact, the difficult problem is the requirement that an American company must demonstrate there are no qualified US citizens available for the position. So the bar here is not, the immigrant needs to be as good as the average American worker. There need to be no qualified American workers. That's an extremely difficult bar to pass. That makes it difficult for many companies to sponsor a visa, even if they would like to, in the United States. So the trick here is to leverage a permissive visa country. Australia and Canada are famously permissive. You can simply do a Google search and find out about some of these. Mexico is actually, I think, an underrated option. If you are thinking about moving to the United States eventually, Canada and Mexico being our neighbors is a good move. And then also the United States has strong ties to Australia. Not to mention the fact that Australia has a fairly strong tech market with companies like Atlassian, where you can move to Australia and then move into big tech and then move to the United States through big tech. So do some research, depending on your home country, the easiest country for you to move to may vary. Depending on your social network, the easiest country for you to move to may vary. And you can also leverage corporate sponsors to allow you to transfer to non-US countries. So the individual that I spoke to in Somalia may be considering working for a company that would allow them to eventually transfer to Dubai in the UAE. And tech is doing quite well in Dubai. So they could go anywhere they like from there. So do your research, depending on your particular circumstances, the best countries will vary. But as I said, in general, at the global level, Australia and Canada are well known for having permissive visa system. Finally, visas can take some time while you're pursuing that, you can do some freelance work. Obviously you can go to Upwork or Fiverr and work personally. You can also work through offshore agencies. What agencies would I recommend in particular? The answer is that I would recommend TopTal, some TopTal competitors, and Turing, who is a TopTal competitor. Do some research, but here's an article of some of the competitors. You'll notice that some of these have presence in various countries, so you might look for where your country specializes. For example, I think Lemon.io has a strong presence in Russia, and Unicorn Dev, Unicorn Dev is an example of one that has a presence in Africa. And there are also a number of agencies that have a strong presence in Latin America. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to like and subscribe.